And I mentioned, if I was the only one here tonight and he came here just so I could hear him, it was enough. Because I, I brought him for me. Y'all just getting in on it. <laughs> That's how I've always felt about him, you know. And uh, I love him with all my heart. Uh, Brother Rick Sandusky's here with him, drove him down. Y'all give Brother Rick a hand. We're so glad. Rick and his wife uh, was a great host for Sister Lori and I while we were up there. We ate at his son's barbecue place. Excellent barbecue. Most time you don't find good barbecues north of here, but we found some there. It was excellent, so we thank you for that. But a voice. Your voice is very important. There are voices on my phone. You ever have to give up your phone and get another phone? And you knew there were voices on that phone that you don't know how to get off of there from friends who have loved ones that have passed and and you I remember when Carlos a friend of mine was was murdered years ago I had his voice on my phone and I would just keep listening to him talking to me you know it means something so allow the voice tonight to speak to you Jesus said uh my sheep they know my voice they hear it and the unique thing is this just like your DNA and your blood type there's no voice the same We'll say it, that sounded like Waylon Jennings. Yeah, it sounded like Waylon Jennings, but it wasn't Waylon Jennings. You know what I'm saying? And, and so to hear a voice is a great thing. Amen. Lord bless the children. I got you, Sheila. I saw it. I'm a professional. Don't forget. Love you guys. Go have a great class tonight. Would you welcome my pastor, Mike Van Britson, <laughs> Belleville, Illinois. No, I do. Push it a little hard. It's a little hard. I have loved this pastor in this place and uh, people for a long time. Um, outside of my family, there is no one who has been a truer friend to me than Pastor Jerry. People come into our lives for all sorts of reasons. Some teach us life lessons and we never forget. Some nurture us and help us become better people. Some simply love us and help us become better people. Some simply love us with all their hearts. Then there are people like you, Pastor. You do all those things and, and more. And I love you. Love Lori. Love the ministry staff here. Got emotional hugging people I hadn't seen for a while. I thought, well, I'm going to break down and cry here tonight. <laughs> now, you need to um, let me be who I am and not be worried about what I'm doing. Uh, sometimes when you decide to be led of the Spirit, folks don't understand what you're doing. But I want to tell you, when I was 20 years old, old, I had God open the eyes of my understanding and I realized what a miracle that I needed Jesus and he made it real to me. Uh, I was baptized in water immediately and filled with the gift of the Holy Ghost. Um, I was driving down the street. I was angry. I had b bad, bad temper and uh, I was angry over something and I was gunning the car and tearing it up, and I didn't hear an audible voice, but my senses and my body responded like I'd heard the voice of God, and the words were, be gentle with all things, and as I said, I didn't hear the voice, but my body responded as if I heard God's voice, so I had to pull off the side of the road shaking and processing what just happened. That was the beginning of me finding out that you can know the voice of God. That he has a voice. And we have a third ear. And we can hear him. Now, I cannot explain it, but I cannot deny it. It's real. 
for several weeks, months really, knowing that I was coming here, it was my determined effort not to come with excellency of man's speech or eloquence, but in demonstration of the Spirit. That's where life is and power. Then uh, Brother David Huff kept coming to mind and that I was supposed to tell you, like, I love your music, love you. You always move my soul. And you bless my spirit. Amen. If you're paying attention, I told you that God began to teach me to know his voice. Then as the years have gone by, it's been over 46 years of knowing the Lord Jesus. Once you learn it, then you have to act on it. You get to act on it. You need to wear a helmet because you'll bump your head. You won't hit a home run every time, but you won't learn until you try. So when God is impressing on my heart about David, I realize that God loved you before anybody else loved you. He formed you in the womb of your mother. And he said, I, I need you to tell David that I love him. I said, I'll do that. Sometimes you hear a voice and you listen to the lyrics and you say, hey, this person is a special soul. There's a wisdom and emotion in your voice, David. It's real. And you're not trying to emote soul or performance. It's simply real. God chose you to be a vessel to pour his heart through you. And you've been lovingly a good steward of this gift. I know there's been battles. And I know you're not perfect. But you have strove to keep the gospel in the gift that you have. You could be secular, but you're sacred. You didn't earn it. And you didn't buy it at a store. And you didn't learn it at school. He sought you out, David. He said, I'm going to give you a gift. And you've been faithful with it. I admire, and we all admire your tenacity and your relentless efforts to serve God with the gift that he gave you. And um, there's a verse that I had never read, and I preached on it, <clears throat> but then it kept coming into my heart, you tell David, this is what I'm going to do for him. It's in Ezekiel chapter 36. And God is saying, I'm going to bless you again, Israel. I'm going to bring you back. And in the, that context, Brother David, verse 11, he said, I will multiply upon you man and beast. He's just saying, I'm going to prosper you, and I'm going to um, strengthen you, and I'm going to cause you to be fruitful and, and increase. And they shall increase and bear young. I will make you inhabited as in former times. And that's the nation of Israel. But I'm reading it to you, believing he tells, told me to read it to you. There's going to be new beginnings. This verse rocked my world. He said, I'm going to cause you to be blessed as in former times and do better for you than at your beginnings. Then you shall know that I am the Lord. If anybody's wanting to think about that, even when you can't explain what you believe God said, do it. Because it's not about you. When we obey, it opens the door for him. So, Symbolically, I, I saw myself washing your feet, man. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. And our prayer tonight 
is that God would open the eyes of your understanding. Thank you, Jesus. Strengthen your step. That you can walk into the reality of him doing better for you than he did at your beginnings. It's hard, hard for me to understand how God could do better than what he did for us at our beginnings. The grace that washed our guilt and sin away. The power of the indwelling of the Holy Ghost and God abiding within us. How does it get better? I don't know, but it's his word. Hallelujah. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. So I submit, believe in my heart that I've obeyed him. I'm glad I did it. Let's read the scripture in Jeremiah chapter 38 and start at uh, verse, let's start at verse 3. Maybe I'll read it. Thus says the Lord, this city shall surely be given into the hand of the king of Babylon's army, which shall take it. Therefore, the princes, that's leadership, that's royalty, they're weak. They don't want to obey God. They're a nation of people who do what's pleasing in their own eyes, have no regard for God's word, and they're in leadership, and they're weak. And he said, please let this man be put to death, for thus he weakens the hands of the men of war who remain in this city, and the hands of all the people by speaking such words. But the words that Jeremiah is speaking, he's been speaking for 40 years. He's been a consistent voice declaring that God is God. And he hasn't stopped. He's a weeping prophet. The people will not come back to God. And so they're saying, let's get rid of him. We don't want his word. We don't believe it's of God. For this man does not seek the welfare of this people, but their harm. Then Zedekiah, the king said, he's weak. He's lost his integrity. He's lost his authority. He's lost his power because he has transgressed so much that he no longer has authority. It's like when Lot told his daughters and son-in-laws that the angels have told us this, is going to, this town is going to be destroyed. And they laughed at Lot because he had lost his personal authority. And this king had the same thing happen. He said, look, he's in your hand. I'm king, but I don't run the show. I'm king, and I'm always asking you, what do you want me to do? What do you want me to say? How do you want me to run things? That's not leadership. For the king can do nothing against you. He said, I got no authority here, no power. I got a title, but no authority. So they took Jeremiah and cast him into the, the dungeon. That's not fair. Life's not fair. No. Life will never be fair until the Lord Jesus Christ comes and rules and reigns in total authority and power. That day is coming. But until then, false expectations always lead to frustration. Yes, Life's not fair. Life in a church, life in a family, life at business, it's not fair. So what do we do? We can, we can learn some things here tonight. I know I have. And the king's son, which was in the court of the prison, and they let Jeremiah down. Now they've got ropes, but these ropes only let you down. And in the dungeon, there was no water. You don't live long without water. So Jeremiah is now in the process of starvation and death. But Meyer, Muck and Meyer, he's up to his knees in filth. He's up to his knees in a mess. Everybody gets in a mess once in a while. Uh, excuse me. Everybody gets in a mess often. <laughs> and we get stuck. And this is where he is. He's been let down into a mess. And he's helpless and hopeless. Not really, but that's how you feel. Yeah. Verse 7. Now, Ebed Melech, the Ethiopian, Friends, this is a man of color. It's right. a black man. Right, right. And he is from Ethiopia. Now, he is a bad man. He has been trained. He's militia. He protects the king. And they never, these kind of guys don't draw a line and say, step over it or push you and wait for you to push back. These kind of men, if you're an enemy, they hit you first. He is in an environment of darkness. He's in a jungle where it's he who has the gold rules. And they're trying to 
uh, wall this man, Ebik Melikin, to be like them, but he's been affected by 40 years of preaching of this Jeremiah. Jeremiah doesn't know it because help comes from strange sources. Help comes from surprising sources. And Jeremiah is going to find out that Ebed Melech had been having the Spirit of God move on his heart. And though he was a tough man uh, and is surrounded by mean men, and they tried to wall him in, they couldn't roof him in. He rose above his element. He rose above. We can rise above that. Where we work, where we live, we can rise above it by the grace of God. And he did. He's one of the eunuchs who was in the king's house. He heard that they had put Jeremiah in the dungeon. He heard that they had put Jeremiah in the dungeon. Now to him, that was a call to war. To him, you you can have a good aim in life, but you've got to pull the trigger. And to him, he said within himself, something has to be done because it's not right what they've done to Jeremiah. Now he's going to turn from one individual to 31 individuals because if you can stand up and live your convictions, God will use you to influence other people. And it, we'll see what he does, though. He heard that they had put Jeremiah in the dungeon when the king was sitting at the gate of Benjamin. Verse 8, he is now going to risk his life. I was telling my church there comes a time or two in life where you have to risk it all. Then I said, excuse me, there come many times in life where we have to decide I'm willing to risk my money, my health, my time, my talent, my treasure. And he's ready to risk his life because you don't approach the king without being invited. And he went out of the king's house and he spoke to the king saying, he started naming names. He doesn't care what anybody thinks. He, he's naming names. He said, I want you to know something's wrong going on here. He spoke to the king saying, my Lord, the king, these men have done evil in all that they have done to Jeremiah the prophet. Whom they have cast into the dungeon. This is innocent blood. And he's likely to die from hunger. He's hungry. He's in a mess. He's stuck. And he's hungry. There are a lot of hungry people in the world tonight. And I don't just mean food. Hungry. Hungry for respect. Hungry for salvation. Hungry for love. Hungry for freedom. Hungry to get loose of a self-destructive addiction. This man is going to have a rope. He's going to have a plan. And it's going to work. And we as Christians have been given a rope. And we've been given a plan. We just need to use it. Amen. And he's likely to die. Ibn Melek his heart is deeply moved and he's ready to risk it all for what matters. And he's likely to die from hunger in the place where he is for there's no more bread in the city. Then the king, you see, most people are waiting for someone inspiring to come into their life. We all have noble abilities, but that's why it's important to be a part of a good church. Have some spiritual friends. Where when you're feeling weak, they inspire you to stand up, square your shoulders, start praying again, start believing again, realizing the grace of God that if God's for you, who can be against you? You need some spiritual support. How many have somebody like that in your life? You have a a gifted and eloquent pastor and preacher. And my my pastor, whom was my first righteous hero I'd ever had in my life, he loved uh, Pastor Jerry, and I, I do too, but... You have inspiration every time you get together. Amen. It's a blessing. I'd support it. I believe in the mortar of all things we build are the blood of the sacrifice of time, talent, and treasure. You can't build something without sacrifice. And it's time uh, to risk it all for things that matter. But we'll get to that in a minute. Take from here 30 men. It's going to, one man on fire is going to affect 30 men. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Don't give up if you're the only one. Just decide if I'm the only one, I'll be the only one. But you won't be the only one for very long. Take from here 30 men with you and lift Jeremiah. Lift him. They, They let him down. I'm sending you to lift him. The prophet out of the dungeon before he dies. So Ebed-Melech took the men with him 
and went into the house of the king. This is extremely interesting. This is what caught my attention, and I had to dig into chapter 38 and chapter 39 and had, had the time of my life reading this. It's a can of worms. Just thoughts saying, look at me, look at me. Remember you in grade school and you had the right answer and you just, call on me, I know the dad burn answer. And all these thoughts, applications are calling out to me. Look at me, Mike, look at me. But one of them really got a hold of me. So he's on his way to where Jeremiah is in a mess and stuck and dying. And he, he goes to the house of the king under the treasury, which we all believe is precious. And he took from under the treasury the lust of the eye, the lust of the flesh, the pride of life, everything the world craves, a treasury. But he went underneath it and he found some old clothes and old rags. Now that got my attention. He's got a rope. He's got 30 men. But he first goes to the king's palace and he looks for old clothes, things that other people no longer sell, saw value in. I'm telling you what, there is value in telling people that Jesus Christ is the living son of God. There is value in that. Even though the church world too often gets away from what really works, it'll never stop being the answer. Jesus, people say, what's the gospel? I say, it's a person. It's Jesus. They say, well, I don't know if I can witness. I don't know if I have the ability to share. You have a testimony of what Jesus did for you. So tell them what Jesus did. It's the name that breaks the curse. It's the name that lifts up those that are down. It's the name. I was riding back on an airplane from Dallas just a week ago, and uh, it's first come, first serve. And um, there was a seat next to me and I started praying. My wife's next to the window. I'm in the middle. And I started praying because they said it's a full ride. Everybody's going to be sitting in a seat. So I start praying. There's some people I don't want sitting there. I won't tell you who. But I started praying. And a 25-year-old man looked at the seat and said, would you mind if I sat there? I said, that would be great. I'm still talking about the name of Jesus. And uh, so I'm praying, Lord, just... Give me an opportunity. I, I'm, uh, I'm tired. I won't take a nap. It takes an hour and a half to fly from Denver to St. Louis, and I'm thinking I'm going to sleep. Well, he gets on, and I'm thinking I'm not going to sleep. And he talked with me for an hour and a half all the way into St. Louis. And I kept putting bait out there. You know, if you fish, you got to put bait out there. And then he said he was uh, born and raised a Catholic, and I said, hey, so was I. And I said, you know, uh, it wasn't until 19 years of age that I had a vibrant faith uh, in Jesus Christ. And so we just kept talking and honest to God. About three minutes later, he stopped what he was saying, which was quite a bit. He looked at, he looked at me and he said, what do you mean that you did not have a vibrant faith until you were 19? And I, it's like one of those movies where everything goes, stops, and I'm going, what did he just ask me? <laughs> so then I was able to share my testimony. My testimony is always Jesus. 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 You mentioned the name all that you can. I have a sign on my garage that says, remember Jesus. It's in red and white, big letters. I think that's, to me, it's profound. Remember Jesus. If you don't know him, remember, find out about him. If you know him, remember him. Get away from religion, get back to him. Remember Jesus. So he said, get, he went and got some old clothes and old rags, things that people no longer so value in, and he let them down by ropes, okay, into the dungeon to a man who's being treated unfairly, to a man who's in a mess. He shouldn't be in a mess, but he's in a mess, and he's stuck, and he's dying. Then Ibn Melek, the Ethiopian, the man of color, the man who is surprising Jeremiah that he, he's even concerned about him. Right, right, right. And the man that's stuck, and the man that's in a mess, the man that's slowly dying without water or food, sees a rope descending. This rope won't let him down. This rope's going to pick him up. 
and he hears a voice. You're coming out. You're coming out. My God, what that, well, how that would feel. You're coming out. How many of you, after you accepted Christ, you began to realize that old things had passed away and all things had become new? And what used to destroy you no longer had power. But you began to feel the uplifting power of God's rope. And you began to believe every day that you don't have to stay. You don't have to think. You don't have to talk. You don't have to live the way you used to. There's a voice saying, you're coming out. You're coming up. No matter what you're stuck in, you're coming out. Oh, my God. What, I'd like to have been there. But then these words of comfort, please. This is a killer. This is an assassin. Right, right. He said, please. It speaks of affection. God wants to cause us to fall in love with the lost. I, I watched a little video. Let me get away from that. I watched a little video, and it said the man walking the bride down the, the aisle is not her dad, but he has her dad's heart. Her daddy had been murdered, and they took his heart and harvested and put it in this man. And this man, with her daddy's heart, walked her down the aisle. I want God's heart. Ezekiel said, I'll put a heart of flesh in you and take out a heart of stone. People, and I've said it at times, but I don't like to witness. I, I, I'm a fearful. I, I can't. Stop. Stop. Put your ear next to the Bible and hear the prophet say, I will put a new heart within you. A heart that loves God, that loves his creation. I'll put a heart in you that you'll hear the cry of people who've gone to hell and they're crying out, don't let my brother come. Don't let my mother come. Don't let my sisters come. You say you're not called, then put your ear to the Bible. You'll hear the call. And you won't feel adequate, but that's when you begin to claim the promise. He'll put a new heart in me that loves him with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength. That loves my neighbor as myself. That doesn't look at a girl that's highly tattooed. Her hair is purple, green, and orange. Her dirty fingernails. Her hair is dirty. Working at a McDonald's and you're criticizing her. And that God would get a hold of your heart and say, you don't realize that when she left from home today, she doesn't have a mother there. She's got a dad that's a drunk. She She doesn't know what it's like for someone who loves her to brush her hair out and to help her pick out some perfume, to help her pick out some clothes that where God could break your heart over the condition of lost people. He said, please, please, Jeremiah, I want to get you out of this mess. And the truth is you're in a mess, but it's also true that I'm going to help you out. It's true that we all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But it's also true that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That's comfort. He said, put some comfort under your arms. So when I put the truth of the rope that's going to lift you up, it doesn't cut you. Hallelujah. He began to feel that upward pull. And I would just imagine that Ibn Malik said, get a hold of the rope. Get a hold of it. There's so many applications. Can you see them? They're everywhere. Please put these old clothes and rags under your armpits, under the ropes. And Jeremiah did so. It's a beautiful text. I'd never read it before. In Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 4, let's see something that God thought about Jeremiah. Then the word of the Lord came to me came to me, Jeremiah, the man who's in a mess, the man who's stuck, the man who's dying. Then the word of the Lord came to me saying, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart for a purpose. I ordained you a prophet to the nations. Behold, and then said I, ah, Lord God, behold, I cannot speak for I'm a youth. But the Lord said to me, you see, you got the Lord speaking. God has a voice. We can hear his voice. And the, the Lord said to me, do not say I'm a youth, 
for you shall go to all to whom I send you, and whatever I command you, you shall speak. Do not be afraid of their faces, for I'm with you to deliver you, says the Lord. Pastor Jerry, that's one of the first verses I memorized when Brother Van said, you need to start teaching in Sunday school. You need to start using a, a teaching because I believe you're anointed to do that. And so I, I memorized that verse. Don't look at their faces. Don't look at their faces. If God called you, then obey. God called you, speak. Faces are misleading. What? Well, I could preach all night. There's so many applications, but I must not do that. Did we read all to eight? So when Ebed Melech had God stirring his heart, I believe God was saying to Ebed Melech, I loved him before you loved him. I formed him in the womb of his mother. Okay, and I need somebody to help me. What is evangelism? What is witnessing? It's us saying to God, I'll help you. I'll help you. Why didn't Jesus live in a house? Why didn't he have a house? Well, he did live in a house. Why didn't he have a house? I think the answer is simple. He wants to live in our house. He said, I don't have a place. Can I stay with you? I've been to the Apostle Peter's home right across the street from a synagogue in Capernaum. Just about seven steps, eight steps out of the synagogue, you'd walk right into the Apostle Peter's home. At one time, Jesus looked at the Apostle Peter and said, could I come live with you? Apostle Peter's got his mom living there, his mother-in-law living there. He's got his brother living there. Uh, but uh, the Apostle Peter said, we'll make room. Oh, my God, what a great decision. We'll make room. Move over, make room for Jesus. Make room for Jesus. But he'll never be indebted to you. If you make room for Jesus, he'll stand at the door of your house in Capernaum. And everybody that's ill in the city of Capernaum came to that door and he healed every and all manner of disease. I'm telling you, it's worth it. To make Jesus a place in your life. Let him abide. Let him live. Begin to believe that he's leading you. Don't just be a churchgoer. Be somebody who walks with God. You say, that's, that's too proud. No, it's not. We're called to know him from the creation to the crib to the cross. All he's ever wanted to do is be with us. He's in love with us. But he said, I need some help. I need some help because I loved Jeremiah before you did Ibn Malik. And I told him I'd take care of him, but I need you to help me do it. And I'm going to give you 30 men to help you do it. Things change, people change, places change, friends change, careers change, health changes. God never changes. I, I know the thoughts that I think towards you, says the, the Lord, thoughts of peace and not evil, to give you a future and to hope you may be in a cistern, you may be in a dungeon, somebody that shouldn't have let you down, let you down, but life's not fair. You may be in a mess and you may be stuck, but I'm telling you, there's a God that's saying, I'm going to bring you out no matter what the mess and how tough the stick is. I have learned that people die, but love never dies. Love never gives up. Love never, never, ever gives out. And love never gives in. Lazarus had nothing to offer his friend Jesus. He had been dead four days. His flesh was rotting. He stunk. But he was the friend of Jesus. And Jesus never gives up on us. He's not only the God of the second chance. He's the God of the slim chance, fat chance, and no chance. Hey, David said, I'll fear no evil. Why? For thou art with me, and I know you'll never leave me. Ebed Melech, he had a privileged life working for the king. He was trained. He had a future, but he risked everything. He's one of those men that says we ought to obey God rather than man. He said, I don't care what the rest of you idiots and fools are doing in politics. That's what they were, politicians. He said, I don't care what you're doing. I'm not even going to fight politics. I'm going to listen to the voice of God, and I'm going to take me a rope, and I'm going to take some comfort, and I'm going to find somebody that's in a mess and stuck, and I'm going to tell them, you're coming out. You're coming out. We're talking too much about politics, and we need to get back and fall in love with Jesus and get a hold of the rope. I'm on my way. I'm on my way. When Abraham heard that Lot and his family had been captured, he said, family, we're going to go get them. 
My God, I love family, don't you? Yeah. I mean, there's nothing thicker than blood. And they may not be perfect, but I'll take family. And Abraham said, they're, they're lost. They've been captured, and we're going to go get them. I don't know how many people called out my name in prayer before Jesus made himself real to me, but someday I'm going to find out. Somebody held a rope for me and said, I want to lift Mike up out of the mess and the muck and the mire of sin and self-destructive lifestyle. Oh, God, I had an Ebed Melech uh, standing before the king for me. Yeah, and when I was 20 years old, I, I saw that rope. I saw that rope and I latched on to it and I, I've made it my book of books. I don't believe any other book could possibly be more important than this book. And this book is wonderful, but it's not that it's wonderful. It's what we bring to the book that makes it work. You got to bring a mind that's trying to study. A book can be great, but if you don't read it to, to learn or to understand it, it won't release its treasures. So don't, don't read your Bible at night when you've had, you know, a package of Oreos. Dr. Pepper, and you're laying your head, and your fat little chin has the blankets up under it, and you think you're going to meet with God. Jesus is our example. He woke up a great while before Dave, and he sought his father. Man, if you're going to get something in God's book, you need to bring tools to it. Can I get an amen? amen? Hurting people hurt people, healed people, reach out to other people. Samuel had God, God kept calling him, I need your help. I need you, Samuel. And finally, he was told by someone who had already lost their walk with God, if he calls you again, say, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. And Ebed Melech said, speak, Lord, your servant's listening. Isaiah said, then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send and who will go for us? And I said, here am I, here am I, send me. Hallelujah. People say, I don't know what to do in church. You know, I never have that problem. From the minute I was saved, you look, it's like me waking up at my house and uh, walking out of the bedroom and seeing that on the kitchen counter, there are dirty dishes from last night and there's debris on the floor that the wastebasket's overflowing and the dinner table uh, we've left because we were in a hurry to get to bed. We were tired. So it's still got things. For me to say, I don't know what to do. It's like being in a church and saying, I don't know what to do. When my wife and I got saved, we got, I might need some bodyguards now. I'm going to say th some things that you might not like, but I bet you do because you're midweek people. But I found things. My wife, when we found that the, the bathrooms needed uh, painting, so we started painting. We just got saved. We just got in the church, but there was something to do, so we started painting that. Found out the nursery uh, wasn't working at all. It was just, if you got a kid, tough. And... Um, so we started that, and I found out that people who visit didn't get follow-up letters. I found out that people usually sit in familiar places every Sunday. So I asked some of the other guys, new converts, I said, let's cut this church up into sections and be shepherds. And that's your group, that's your group, that's your group. And every Sunday, you're there to greet them. And if they're not there, you're there to find out if they need a hospital visit. Do they? So we made shepherds. Nobody asked me to do that. But you see, people who say, I don't know what to do in church, you're not looking. Come on, look, look, look. Pick up paper that somebody throws down. Um, ask, how can I help? Yeah, that's good preaching. Yeah. <laughs> Jeremiah, I know what happened, and I know you're in a mess, and I know you feel stuck, helpless, hopeless, and you're st standing there, and you need some help, some lifting prayer, some new beginning. You're coming out. Put these rags of expectation under your arms. I'm convinced I've, I've said that what needs to be said, so I, I want to end with this. And for teachers, whether you take this advice or not, don't labor so hard to explain everything in your lesson. Declare the Word of God and let the Spirit of God interpret it to the heart of the listener. Be as good as you can on the subject, but declare the Word. Declare the Word. Challenge your, uh, your students to read the Word, to read the Word. I'm not going to bore you with the details of a storm I once walked through, but I'd like to share a blessing that came out of it. The storm left me with two alternatives. One, I could live in worry, fear, uncertainty, what would happen next, but that was an unbearable burden. Two, the other alternative was birthed or born of desperation. 
was simply to live in utter, childlike, dependent on God. To fill my mind with His promises and assurances. I was embraced and enveloped by the pure joy of a blessed abandon with eternal vigilance. I lived in one day compartments, minute by minute, refusing fear, refusing worry, believing His word. I let go of everything I had thought was security and I lived shipwrecked on God. Shipwreck means I hung to a piece of board out in the ocean. I clung to Jesus. I, I clung to his promises. It was all I had. I found out that that's Christianity. It's every day to cling to him like he's your way of thinking, your way of talking, your way of living, clinging shipwrecked. For me, there was no other way. If I was to survive, if I was to live, to hope, and to avoid an emotional and mental breakdown, I had reached a critical hour of my life. I'd been saved. My trouble became a threshold to knowing him again. But I have realized now in the past 10 years that I don't know the Lord. That's not a negative. He's more wonderful than I ever thought he was. I thank God for my storms. I thank God for people that have left me. I thank God for the unfairness of life because it pushed me to a threshold to where all I had was him. And I don't ever want to let go of that rope because it lifts me out of the messes of life. And I'm like you. I have self-destructive tendencies, but I know what to hold on to to lift me out of. Life can put us in a desperate hour like that, but a choice. There's nothing more powerful than changing your mind. To begin to believe what God says. Mercy withholds the knife from the heart of Isaac. Grace provides a ram in the thicket. Mercy runs to forgive the prodigal son. Grace throws a party with every extravagance possible. I'm reading this for a purpose. Mercy bandages the wounds of the man beaten by the robbers. Grace covers the cost of his full recovery. Mercy hears the cry of the thief on the cross. Grace promises paradise this very day. Mercy withholds what we've earned. Grace provides blessings we have not earned. There's a rope from God that will lift us out of every mess, whether we made the mess or not. Could you close your eyes in a posture of prayer? It was a struggle to get here. And I'm not going to go into the issues. But deep down, I knew I was supposed to get here. I believe with all my heart, according to Scripture, that I'm a messenger, a mediator. I'm in a nation of priests and kings. I represent God towards man. I believed I, I was given a message from the Lord for you. Maybe not every one of you, maybe every one of you, but certainly for some of you. You're in a mess. You feel stuck. You feel helpless and hopeless. It may be finances. It may be marriage. It may be friendships. It may be a self-destructive habit. But you're in a mess. Maybe it's a, you, you gotten into, you're stuck in bitterness. Shouldn't have happened. They shouldn't have left. They shouldn't have did that. Shouldn't have said that. But I'm here tonight to give you a rope and the words. He's going to lift you out. Now, I believe in calling people forward and saying, we're going to pray in the name of Jesus. We're going to put a rope around you in the words of comfort. Whoever calls upon the name of the Lord. Whoever calls upon the name of the Lord. If you can believe, all things are possible to him that believeth. Is there someone here tonight that when God told me, you go tell them this, because I need somebody to give them that message, and Mike, you go. I've told Jerry to ask you. I told Pastor Jerry to ask you. But I'm I'm the one asking you. Go there and tell them, because there's somebody there that's been treated unfairly. There's somebody there that made a bad decision and they're in a mess. But you tell them that I've loved them with an everlasting love. I've tattooed an image of them on both of my hands.
I never forget them. I'm for them. Could we stand together? I had you close your eyes. Would you stand together? Would you let me pray for at least one person tonight? You'd, you would bless me if you'd say, yes, Pastor Mike. Something in that message really spoke to me. If you'd let me and Pastor Jerry pray for you and slip the rope of faith, hope, and charity. Faith in God. Hope of expectancy. Knowing that you're loved. Father, tonight in Jesus' name. I gave your word. I believed that what you gave me. Please don't let anyone that's supposed to respond just walk out. Please let them become desperate like I did. And say, I've got to have, I've got to have help. I've got to have Jesus. I've got to have his freedom. Would you come and stand and and we'll pray with you and for you and can we sing a song with them, Dave? Okay. At least let me pray for one person. That God would begin to lift you. Me, oh Lord. You I know that he's got a plan for your life, and I know that he's good. I know that he's good. In the name of Jesus, we lay our hands on you. Declare a lifting, a liberating, a lifting, a liberating. You get a hold of that like that rope. You get a hold of, tonight I sought the Lord in And he delivered me from this fear. He delivered me from this mess. He delivered me from what I'm supposed to do. He delivered me. I got a hold of that rope. I'm not going to let go. I'm coming up. I'm coming out of. In the name of Jesus. God bless you. You are my covenant. In the name of Jesus, I know that he loves you with all, all of what he is. I am broken hearted. He formed you in the womb of you your mother. Me till I'm whole. He knows you. No you one else knows you, but he knows you. He's going to put a rope around My you. To you begin to lift you up. You get a hold of that rope. Remember that tonight I sought the Lord and he heard me. And he delivered me from the thing that's got me stuck. He's delivered me from the belief that this mess is going to be forever. He delivered me. He made me free. He said, I'm coming out to come into something more wonderful than I've ever known. Whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall experience, you see, a deliverance, a freedom, a new beginning. Remember, I sought the Lord and he heard me and he delivered me. From all my fears. Doesn't mean you're not gonna fight. It just means now you know you're going to make it. I'm going to make it. I sit down in your presence. Bless you, honey, in Jesus' name. In your shadow spend the night. Lord in Jesus' name. Shield up strength, my foot. You're loved by God. My refuge. He has more plans for you than you've ever dreamed of. All you can ask or even think because of the power that works in you. In the dark, You've been called out of darkness into marvelous light. God has oh, a plan so glorious. Oh, he loves to shine and outdo I our dreams and our hopes and our aspirations. Glory. But get a hold of the rope tonight that I sought the Lord and he heard me and he delivered me from all my fears. Be a woman of the word of God. Get a hold of it. Make it what you think. Make it how you talk. Make it govern the way you walk. In Jesus' name. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. I believe tonight that God loves you. That he formed each one of you in the womb of your mom. And he has plans beyond your wildest expectations. I've come here tonight to tell you. He, he's bringing you out of the things that you've been stuck in. He's 
bringing you out of things that have been a, whoo, a mess. But you get a hold of the rope, huh? Young man, you get a hold of the rope of God's word. And God, God said this about me. This is who I am. This is what I have. Always hold on to the rope because it'll keep lifting you up. Lifting you out. Freeing you. In the name of Jesus Christ. Whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall experience deliverance and peace and joy and righteousness. Please remember, get a hold of the rope. Get a hold of this word. In the name of Jesus. servant leaders to come up. Such a sweet, sweet spirit in this place. I'm not going to ask you if you enjoyed that because that was just, I was eating at the trough. It was a buffet. Man, I enjoy. You know, I say religiously, I've read my Bible from front to back. We do, don't we? Except for Leviticus. There's the several chapters there. I, I, so when people ask, you ever read your Bible front to back? No. I've been born again over 40 years. I've never read my Bible front to back. I skip through Leviticus. I just jump over a lot of that. But I feel like I jumped over this. I feel like I didn't see that before. At least I didn't see it the way you saw it and made me see it. I saw it different today. And I, too, have been the recipient of people who have pulled me up and out and prayed for me continually all these years. I need you tonight to sacrifice, hurt yourself financially. Speaking to me, too. Um, Our Sunday was, you know, and and I, after a hurricane, I've always seen it. Just we, our, our offerings dip. I, I never beg you, I'm not going to. The day I beg you, you're going to need another pastor. You know, I'm just, I'm not, I can't do that. But I can tell you this. I will be leaving Thursday to go to a conference. And the speakers will be flown in, and they'll be wined and dined in green rooms. And they'll be staying in the nicest of hotels. And they'll receive a huge plush offering for a 30-minute motivational speak. Some of them I like. I like some of them. But I promise you, the best, the best teaching, preaching that I will hear this week, I just heard. Amen. So get a little crazy tonight with your giving. You know, sacrifice means you scared yourself. Amen. So if you need to offer an envelope, get one quickly. Give me one, guys, Ronnie. Tomorrow night, 7 o'clock. We're being as punctual as we can so we can catch the 7th, 8th, and ninth inning. 
I ain't even going to ask how many of y'all looked at y'all's phones. Because I'd, I'd get you in trouble. But man, I sure enjoyed this tonight. Sure enjoyed this tonight. Uh, we're going to be eating right after. We're, we're not a big group tonight. We've got plenty of room in the back. Let's all go eat. The game is on in the fellowship hall. So we'll be able to watch the game at the end of it. So, you know, I had to watch it in a hotel lobby. Is it worth watching, Dana? Is the game worth watching? Do you know what the score is? Okay. <laughs> Got her in trouble, didn't it, right there? Uh, anyway, it'll be worth watching. We were in a hotel room, in a hotel conference. Uh, I, I mean, uh, the hotel lobby, because the RV wasn't working, the, the, the receiver, because of the rain. So I'm over there with David Huff and Bishop Gary watching it, and they hit that two run and tied up. And then the little giant showed up. <laughs> yeah, it's just a good moment. Just a good moment. Uh, some announcements, guys. The 27th, there'll be an off-road on Sunday. We'll talk more about that for those who are into the four-wheeling and can't connect. I will be getting in touch with some of you that have ministries about where we're going to meet and what we're going to do next month. I have two groups, it looks like, coming in the month of November. We've got a group coming from California. Again, I'm not asking for a big group, just some hands that help and some skilled labor. I even have a group of ladies called Lydia's House, and they're, they're girls that are going through uh, reformation in their own lives, who've been abused, who've been hurt, uh, have uh, been, just literally their lives shattered. And they go to this house, and they get them back on their feet again, and they, they teach them job skills. They're flying down. They're flying down to help us work on the property. I think it's five, six, seven, eight of them coming in. So I just want to get the stuff ready for paint. You know what I'm saying? Get it, get it up to that place. And I got a group coming from Florida. Y'all know that quid pro quo thing? Well, we went to Florida and helped the church out that went through a hurricane. They're sending guys over here to help us out with ours. It, uh, it's, it's reaping and sowing, sowing and reaping. Amen? It's reciprocation. It's the right thing. It's connections, kingdom connections. Amen? All right. Uh, David, come here and make, just, just say something to everybody so I can put my money in my envelope. Hey, listen, I, there was something on my heart, so you know what? I think that was Holy Spirit. Uh, le, Joseph had mentioned it uh, a little bit ago. It, it's October, so in October, it's something that happens in the churches. It's actually National uh, Pastors Appreciation Month. And listen, we... We love our pastor, but we don't appreciate our pastor to the extent that we can. Now, now I ain't saying that we don't give to our pastor, because that's not true, because he's blessed. And he'll be the first person to tell you that he's blessed. But the truth is, the Bible says that those who teach you the word should be given out of the goodness of your lives, out of the fullness of your lives. Why? This guy doesn't go out and have another job so that he can do this. This is his job. And so out of our first fruits and out of our second fruits and our third fruits and our fourth fruits, there's a, a teaching, a principle that happened with Moses. It says that from the beard of Aaron, that they anointed Aaron, which he was a priest. And when God anointed Aaron, it fell from his head and it went all the way down and it anointed all the way to his feet. Listen, when the head of the church is blessed, y'all blessed. Don't expect a church to be paid off without blessing your pastor. Don't expect a church to get through a hurricane when the man's sitting there with his house in the front yard. We have opportunity. It's, the Lord says what you make happen for others, God will make happen for you. That's biblical. If you're looking for financial breakthrough, if you're looking for opportunities that you feel like are just out of reach, opportunities knocking. I think, Ronnie, Sunday, have a bucket in the back. That, yeah, that's what we normally do, right? So I'm going to say this. On Sunday, this will give you a week and then some time to think about it, pray about it, and more importantly, we're going to have buckets in the back. And I think it would be uh, not only beneficial to the house, obviously it's going to benefit him, but really it, giving has very little to do with the recipient. It has everything to do with the person giving it. 
every gift has everything to do with the person giving it, not as much as the recipient. So let your pastor not only know that you love him, let your pastor know that what he's doing is working. <laughs> that he hadn't just been preaching in vain, that he hadn't been marrying y'all in vain and burying y'all in vain and, and making sure your children are good and paying the visits to the hospital and praying the times you don't see praying and fasting the times you don't see fasting. And listen, that, that all is for you guys. It's not for him. Amen. So on Sunday, like I said, there'll be buckets in the back. Bless him. And I promise you, watch how the windows of heaven will be opened Hallelujah. up over your guys' lives. Amen. Amen. Appreciate it. Love you guys. Uh, Pastor Mike, you and Rick, y'all go head on back. Head on back here. They're going to feed you. And we'll be back here in a minute to surround you. Amen. Because if I don't get you out of here, you'll never get out of here. Get your stick. I got one in the truck, just in case I need it. Amen. Lord bless the offering. What time tomorrow night? 7 o'clock. Okay, guys, we're going to try to get it as early as we can. You know what it's going to be about now. Uh, and I'll be honest with you. Give yourself a little time. The traffic from here to there is rough. You saw it when you're coming over. I mean, it, it just takes time. But it's going to be what you endure that's going to show how much you how much you want. you got to endure things to see how much you want it. So you want it enough. Amen. Consider yourself dismissed. God bless you. And go Astros.